are recording now. Welcome everyone out there to the next in our series of online cheese and wine classes. This one focused on the fabulous cheese making state of California, one of my favorite regions for cheese making in the entire world, um, not only in the entire country. So I am super, super excited to take you on an adventure of cheese. My name is Jill. I am the owner of Cheese Teak. And I know that there are lots of you out there who are new, who have never been to any of our classes before. So if you are new, welcome. It's awesome to have you. It's a really fun community. We have a really, really good time. It's super, super relaxed. So welcome to the fold. Um, for those of you that have been to a billion of these cheese classes, uh, I want to thank you for your loyalty and your um, support. It's awesome to have the same names on the classes all the time. It just makes me so very, very happy. So welcome to each and every one of you. Just a quick um, sort of housekeeping of how the whole thing works for those of you that are Sorry. For those of you who, who might be new to class this time, um, is the chat. So the chat is something that allows you to share questions, to share comments. I can't see those, but my husband right over there, my fabulous husband, Jeff, as always, is here to um, read me your questions and read me your comments. So anything that you want to ask about the topic, or if it's off topic, whatever, um, go ahead and ask away. And you will also find that within the chat, People are wonderful about um, answering one another's questions as well. So it becomes this fun little community. And the more wine uh, that is consumed during the class, the, uh, the funnier and more social uh, the attendees tend to get. So please take advantage of the chat. If you have never done it before, this is your day. Anything else before we jump into our shout outs? I think you should jump into the shout -out. Jumping into the shout outs. So we have two very special shout outs here um, tonight. The first um, goes to a very loyal cheese class attendee long before we were even in a virtual mode here. Um, that is Dave and Anita, who have retired and are now moving down to Texas. Very cool. So awesome. And so this is their last class in state with us. I'm hoping to be able to ship them um, classes in the future because it just is not the same without Dave and Anita um, in our classes. So we love you both. Thank you for your years. And I mean years uh, of support of Cheese Teak. And we will miss you very, very much. Um, second shout out is to James Monroe and his wonderful family who are sitting at home doing our class tonight. And I ran into James at Cheese Teak Sherlington actually yesterday while he was picking up his kit. And I got lucky enough to get to meet his wife, Joelle, and his daughter, Emmelyn, um, who really love doing the classes and have done tons and tons and tons of them. So I want to thank you as always for being in the class tonight. And it was super, super cool to meet uh, you all in person yesterday. That's awesome. That's all I got. That's the cool. shout outs. All right. All right. Let's go ahead and get started with our wine because that's always the most fun um, way to kick off any sort of event, if you ask me. Um, so basic format, we're going to talk about our wine. We're going to taste our wine. We're going to taste our first couple cheeses. And then we're going to talk about a little bit about the history of California wine and the history of California cheese, just to give you some sort of perspective. And then we're going to taste our remaining three cheeses. And Jeff will do his absolute darndest to keep me on uh, uh, on task and mm. on time. So we'll see how that works out for us tonight, shall we? So we're going to jump right into our wine. And I cannot tell you how supremely, supremely excited I am to have gotten my hands on the Diatom. So the cool thing about Diatom, it is made by one of the most esteemed American winemakers, a gentleman named Greg Brewer. Um, who is just famous for making some of the greatest wines in the country. He has his own um, winery now. One of his products is this called Diatom. And it is made in Santa Barbara, um, so actually more south um, in California, which is really, really cool to be making wines that far south, as opposed to a lot of people are familiar with kind of northern California winemaking, not so much with southern California, not that it doesn't happen, um, but we may not always be just quite as familiar with it. So um, Greg is considered a true pioneer in the world of, um, of Santa Barbara winemaking in the Santa Anita Hills and, and that surrounding area, in an area where people thought you couldn't grow grapes well, you couldn't make great wine there, forget it. He has just nailed it. Um, and in 2020, he was named the um, winemaker of the year by wine enthusiast. Wow, that's awesome. Which is like huge. That's around the whole world. Um, and that was for his amazing influence um, of getting sort of that the region where he's making his wines recognized by the international wine community. So it's a really, really cool thing that he has done. The wine is a fantastic wine. It is named after um, a uh, plankton, um, not a plankton, a plankton, oh my gosh, the word fossil. My goodness, a diatom is a fossilized 
plankton um, that uh, were ab abounding, abundance in abundance in that part of the world millions and millions and millions of years ago. So it was a prehistoric sea. And so now the land is literally consists of um, layers and layers and layers thick of deceased um, diatoms, so, or the, or the uh, deceased plankton, I should say, that have fossilized. And it is a very, very specific and very unique type of soil in which to grow grapes. I'm going to interrupt you and yes, just try to please. read. So you've written in your notes here this yes. word, diatomaceous. Yes, it is called diatomaceous soil. Yeah. Anyways, so you put I aceous just, on the end of anything and it's like, you know, an Sounds active, very important. Right? Like yeah. that was a Jeffacious comment. Yes. Okay. Back to you, Jill. Back to the Jellacious section of the class then. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, so this again is diatom. This is a 100% Chardonnay. This wine is, it never sees any oak at all. So it is aged completely in stainless steel. The whole mission with making this wine, um, with Greg's mission was to have what he describes as a luxurious wine that is still, and this is his word, skeletal. How wow. cool is that? So he's going for like the purest, purest, purest embodiment of all that is beautiful about Chardonnay. So he's not doing malolactic fermentation. He's not doing oak aging. He is taking the fruit, harnessing it and making this unbelievable wine. He grows the grapes for this wine on only one block of his entire vineyard. So one tiny, tiny area is all the only location where the grapes come from for diatom. And the way he, he introduces sort of variety in there is that he will harvest his grapes at different periods in the harvest cycle. So because Santa Barbara is further south, it has a very, um, and it's a very high elevation as well, relatively. Um, so it has um, a long growing season, which is really, really wonderful. It has very big temperature shifts between day and night. And um, so they get lots of sun, lots of warm days and very, very cool nights. The growing season is very long. So he has the luxury of actually revisiting the same block over and over again to harvest grapes throughout the harvest period. And so that's how he creates sort of layers and layers of flavor in his Chardonnay. Who's ready to taste it? Me. While you're pouring and preparing right. to taste, I'm going to let you know that today is Laura's birthday. <gasps> Hold and on. Laura I can't sing and pour at the same time, though. From California. Okay. Hi, Laura. Uh, right near Santa Barbara. So she thought this wine was. Oh, well, that is awesome. Just Happy for her. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you, Laura. Happy birthday to you. Pretty cool, huh? There you go. I had to put the wine down before I did that, though, because all oh, heck could break loose. You never know. So again, this is the diatom, diatom and we are talking 100% Chardonnay here, and its purest, most luxurious, and yet skeletal form, which I just absolutely adore that. What you're going to notice in this is if you are a fan of white uh, Burgundy, you are going to totally bond with this wine. It's going to be very, very reminiscent of that. It's got a great sort of like uh, a little bit of a salinity to it. Um, it's very close to the ocean where the, uh, the grape is uh, grown. So good salinity, but also fantastic minerality and stoniness and sort of this chalkiness um, that comes from that very, very special soil. It smells absolutely fabulous. It smells like bright. We get some nice sort of stone fruit scents there, a little bit of honeysuckle, really, really fabulous. A little bit of citrus. Mm -hmm. That is one fine wine, my friends. Wine. Is that not delicious? It's <clears throat> outstanding. So what I will tell you about the diatom is um, it is so beloved that when I was selecting this wine for the class, um, my uh, the vendor with whom I was working said, you better get it now because you won't be able to get it anymore. And I said, how is that possible? This is like this amazing wine. And it just it was just released. And he said, because um, Roots Chris, I think, oh no, Capital Grill has picked this wine up and it's going to be on their sort of select wine list. Oh, wow. So, so he's like, they're basically the country, getting it all. all of it. They're getting it all. So in the future, if you want diatom, you're going to have to go to Capitol Grill. Not that, I mean, there's anything wrong with that. I mean, I'll go. Um, but we do have it left in the store. But then that's, that's pretty much it that you're going to see. Which is oh, it's a cool story. Good success story for the wine. Yeah, but absolutely, wine. absolutely love this one. Any questions about this wine before we move on? So there's an observation. So G cheese? James sure. Monroe says that they aren't typically, the Monroes aren't typically white wine people, but they think this is really exceptional. Why do, why do you think that might be? I will tell you why. Okay. Because it is often sort of tongue in cheek stated that Chardonnay is the red wine of white wines. 
Mm. So Chardonnay has a lot of qualities. If, like, in other words, if you didn't look at the color, if you were blindfolded and, and it weren't chilled, right? And you just tasted Chardonnay at red wine temperature next to a, an actual red wine, you would have a little bit more trouble differentiating between the two. Chardonnay has a very sort of rich um, experience. It's very textured. It has great, great structure. It has a lot of bump, a lot of flavor, for lack of a better word. Um, it's aromatic. So you tend to get a lot of really pronounced personality from Chardonnay, um, which is why people think they can kind of like, you know, mess with it a lot. They can add oak to it. They can do special kinds of fermentation that make it more buttery. Or, so um, it just has a lot of personality. And so this is why people tend to, it, red wine drinkers love Chardonnay. Pretty and neat. sometimes when they don't love any other white wines because of that, it has beautiful bracing acidity, but it's not like sweet tart acidity. It's not like drinking, for instance, um, sometimes a Sauvignon Blanc that is so, so um, acidic, which is wonderful, but it can really, like you have almost a, an instant reaction to it. This has wonderful <clears throat> balanced acidity that goes right up against the, the sort of the structure and the density of the wine. It has a great mouthfeel. So that's probably why would be would be my guess. So James wants mm -hmm. the court reporter to uh, note for the record that the term he used was stupenderful, and I twisted it a little bit. So I will never remember that, but that is really really good. stupenderful. Yes. Okay, and okay. then this is another interesting point. So sure. Thomas and Colleen note that hey, it's, Thomas and Colleen, it's not buttery, which is no. a lot of what we're used to as it relates to California Chardonnays. For sure. So California yeah. Chardonnays have a distinct reputation and you will often even hear people go, oh, I don't like California Chardonnay. Like that's an entire class of wine, right? Um, there are myriad um, sort of versions of Chardonnay being made in California, a lot like this and a lot of the more buttery uh, American style, so to speak, or California style Chardonnay. And the way that you achieve that is A, by something called malolactic fermentation, which is a special type of fermentation that they allow to occur. And that creates those kind of butter popcorn flavors and a really sort of rich, almost um, viscous quality in the wine, which a lot of people are like, no bueno. Um, and a lot of people really, really seek that out and love it. Um, and then also, of course, aging in oak will give the wine, um, even if it doesn't give it oaky flavor always, which sometimes it does, um, but it will just give it some additional sort of roundness um, and kind of a density and again, almost a viscosity feel. It gives it a lot more structure. So there is a special type of fermentation. And then again, aging in oak is going to give you that butteriness, it's sometimes called butter popcorn um, for sure. And so this, and, and mm -hmm. Keith and Amy note this, huh. this particular one is much more similar to a European style. For sure. Yeah. So um, as I alluded to earlier, um, if you are a white Burgundy fan, white yeah. Burgundy, of course, Burgundy being in France, one of the most famous wine regions in the world, and grows primarily two grapes, which is Pinot Noir or Chardonnay. White Burgundy is Chardonnay. If you are a white Burgundy lover, again, this is right up your alley. You're going to absolutely you're going to love this one. And considering how hard it is to get almost anything from France right now, OMG, um, go American. There you go. You will never go wrong with the diatom. All right, Any Jill. Any comments or questions? Yeah. No. Um, you have in uh, your order of operations mm -hmm. here a history of California wine. Next. I feel like we should talk. I have the first cheese first. Yes, I was going to say, yes. let's, let's eat some. Uh, let's yeah. eat some cheese. Yeah. Okay. So the first cheese is a cheese. We've actually had this in class before, and it's almost like I just can't almost do a California class without featuring Mount Tam. It is just absolutely one of my favorite, favorite, favorite cheeses in the world. And, um, and I think very emblematic of a very special kind of spirit in California cheese making, which is a very sort of pioneering spirit, a very um, innovative spirit. And it's captured 100% in this cheese called Mount Tam. So Mount Tam is made um, in Northern California, just north of San Francisco. And it is made by a cheesemaker called Cowgirl Creamery. They also make cheeses like Red Hawk. And um, I mean, they make a thousand Pierce Point. They do a whole number of um, sort of versions of Mount Tam with different goodies going on in them. But Mount Tam is the original. And I adore this cheese. It is an organic triple cream cow's milk cheese, which means there's extra cream added to the milk to make it much more fatty and gooey. And then it's got this beautiful sort of white velvety rind on the outside, which is edible. So everyone out there, if you're like, oh, am I supposed to eat that? The answer is yes, you absolutely want to eat the soft ripened rinds. And anyone who's been to a number of our classes will say, yes, you do eat the rind, eat the rind. So you definitely want to eat the rind on this one. So again, Mount Tam is aged a very short period of time, just a few weeks in order to allow the mold on this cheese to begin to grow and proliferate and 
start to affect the interior of the cheese by making it even more gooey and buttery. And I see my daughter Liberty has oh so subtly snuck down into the kitchen here because she heard me utter the phrase Mount Tam and she's her favorite cheese in the world. So is that why you're here or did like yeah. your sister, sister like fall off a ladder or something? Oh, okay. Okay, would you like some Mount Tam? Okay, please come help yourself, darling. Say hi to everyone. Hello. Okay. All right. So that is Mount Tam. Absolutely one of the most splendid, obviously a beloved cheese in our household because you saw Libby came just scampering down to get herself um, a piece of the Thank Mount you. Tam. Now you also have in your little collection here some beautiful Effie's oat cakes. Part of me wants to tell you not even to taste them um, because once you do, you will not be able to stop eating the Effie's oat cakes. You may look at them and be like, oh, what are those? Just like a biscuit? No, they are like the greatest things. I had to hold my children back when I was opening things up today like this, because they were like reaching around me, you know, trying to, to grab the Effie's oat cakes off of the board here. So I would have had no oat cakes left if I were not so ferocious. Um, so Effie's oat cakes, really, really wonderful. Just kind of eat them as an accompaniment. Most of our cheeses don't require any like vehicle to get to your face. So you can certainly just enjoy munching on these as we go through the class. And then we have some of Chef Natasha's homemade pear preserves. Wonderful. Just cause. So Thomas and Colleen want me out yes. of here and they want Libby to host again. Libby, so for those of you that have never been in, in, in a class where Libby has hosted before, there has been, a, um, there have been, I should say, a couple times where Jeff has been unavailable and Liberty has stepped in and, um, and hosted the class with me and she just did a bang up job. So um, poor Jeff, when he came back for the class after she hosted the um, uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day class, everyone was a little bit disappointed. I think that Jeff was back. I think they were hoping he was like out of commission or something, but anyway. So as my payment. Yes. Like yes, you may have an Effie's oat cake, just one as payment. All right, Jill, I'm gonna put up the picture of, yes, uh, the, please. Mount Tan of the cowgirl ladies. Mm -hmm. Perfect. The cowgirls. So, the cowgirls. Um, so really, really fantastic ladies, um, Peggy Smith and Sue Connolly, who created this cheese uh, back in 1997. Um, so when we opened um, in 2004, Cowgirl Creamery was already like a really cool American cheesemaker. And so it was one of the first cheeses I ever carried. Just, really just kind of getting started though, right? Yeah, for sort sure. Of. And in fact, so much so that we had to have it shipped directly from them. Yeah. Um, when we had opened now, you know, distributors carry them. They, they produce much more cheese now. But yeah, it's, it's a really, really beautiful, outstanding cheese. And again, the texture is going to be very akin to like a room temperature butter because there's so much butter fat in this particular cheese. Oh, you're typing quickly. What are you typing? I'm gonna eat Dave one. was just saying that he appreciates the work I do. <laughs> I do too, honey. I think he's trying to just make me not feel bad. But... Mm, I love it. It's like the most perfect balance of kind of a sweet and a salty thing going on. All Maybe right, so this there. is interesting. So Bernadette um, mentions that she thinks the cheese, Mount Tam, tastes different this time than the last time, perhaps Absolutely. in one of these classes. You're awesome for noticing that, yes. Okay, so mm -hmm. I'm gonna be curious why you're mm -hmm. gonna say that's the case, or if it's just always the case, well, but she, she was speculating that it was the wine. It's both things. So first of all, yes, the wine and the cheese are going to not only taste good together, but one will actually bring out flavors and highlight characteristics in the other that you might not have even noticed were there before. So if you enjoy Mount Tam with a light red wine, for instance, you're going to have a very different, even if it's the same piece of Mount Tam, you're going to have a very different Mount Tam experience because the different flavor components of the wines will highlight different flavors in the cheese itself. The second reason it tastes different is this one is a different age. So the last time we had Mount Tam, it was a little bit younger. So you'll notice it had, um, or if you were in that class, it was much more sort of solid. Um, uh, there was more of kind of the solid, you know, chalky, I guess, interior and less of the gooey cream line. Mm. I feel like mine has got this, it's like perfect. It's got this super gooey cream line. In fact, I think it was that class where I told everyone they should go and get two Mount Tams and eat one um, in like two weeks and then eat another one in four weeks. And it would be the same batch and you will see how much they change even over a couple of weeks. So yes, I mean, this, these are just a little bit more uh, ripe. So you're gonna be getting a little bit more of a creamy velvety consistency and less tooth when you chew it. Any other comments or questions, Jeffrey? Yes, I did wanna mention this other please. thing. Can I drink uh, while you please do. mention something? So Liz, um, she suggested that part of it could be the season that the mm -hmm. 
cheese was made, the cows were mm -hmm. eating different things mm -hmm. or different weather. Yeah, for sure. So any of these things matter, right? No, absolutely. Any so as you as the season gets warmer and warmer, the characteristics of the milk itself will also change, and the cheesemaker will usually try and be responsive to that and. Um, uh, sort of treat things a little bit differently. If the cows are more hydrated or less hydrated, if they're more active or less active, sort of what's going on with, with the animal is going to affect subtle things that they do within the recipe. They may notice that it takes longer for the curd to knit together. They may notice that they have to cook things for a little bit longer to make them set. Um, they'll usually try and compensate for that. So they're not like wildly, wildly different. But in a way, when you're talking about smaller production cheeses like this, it's, it's all about embracing those differences Nuances, yeah. you're not having this so that it tastes exactly the same every time you have it the magic is like oh my god i had this like two months ago and it was like a different cheese that's the coolness so how do um, they know if the cow is hydrated do they give it like a zero what do you call it a specific <laughs> gravity test or no. the urine test no, no. um uh, no so typically it, when it's hotter um they will be more hydrated Oh, ironically, because so they like... they'll just drink more and more water. Um, and um, but it also depends how much are they roaming. So if you have mount, um, cows that are going up into pasture and back out, you have to make sure that they're staying really hydrated. So yeah, they'll typically be a little bit more hydrated. Like the morning milking will always be more watery than the evening milking, um, things hmm. like that. You have cool. to kind of blend those things together. All right. Any other questions before we move on? Um, and I figured we would do um, the second cheese as well, and then we'll just do back to back. We'll cool. talk about. Uh, California wine and California cheese. And I'll just kind of zip through those so I don't take too much time. So yeah, that, that's good. So mm -hmm. uh, Martian Lloyd jumped in with a question. Hey, Martian Lloyd. Um, what about, so then they were saying that the temperature outside, how much does that impact the flavor of the cheese? You mean here or like where, I guess they assume, I assume, I, I assume made, what right? they're saying is where the cow is. Not a whole lot. I mean, if, if you're, if it's like the place where they're making cheeses huh? are typically pretty um, temperature controlled. So, you know, how it is outside, it's not like they're standing out, you know, in a pasture making the cheese. So the, that climb, there may be a little bit more humidity at certain times. And so maybe it takes the cheese a little bit longer to age or a little bit less time to age. If there's less humidity, um, it, it can just vary. But typically when you're making cheeses and aging cheeses, you're doing so in a fairly controlled fashion. Even ancient caves where cheeses would have been aged are pretty much a stable temperature and humidity year round. So it, you don't want to have a whole lot of fluctuation in temperature when you're aging cheeses, because you can get unpredictable results, mm -hmm. also known as rotten cheese. Mm. Got to be careful. That does sound unpredictable. Yes. All right. All right. Shall we jump into one of the coolest cheese making things? Yeah. OK. So um, three of these cheeses, these poor cheese makers, I was like, I don't want to have just like regular California cheeses in the class. I'm going to reach out to some cheesemakers that never have their cheeses out in this part of the country. And I'll just like see if they'll send me cheese, right? And a lot of them didn't even respond to me, but three of them did. And, um, and these are the next three cheeses that we are having. So it was back and forth on the phone and through email with these folks. Which cheese should I do? And which one is in the best condition? And can you ship? And they were like, oh, one of them was like, I think we can ship. I don't know. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I'll give you a couple of tips, but like, let's just cross our fingers and hope for the best. So, the so next this is a unique experience and people are going to have cheese tonight. That you literally you, never. The yes. only other option is 3000 mile trip. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Wow. Correct. Cool. Yes. So it's pretty, pretty cool stuff. Um, and the first example of this is a cheese called Aries. Um, oh, and by the way, I brought some large examples because I just like y'all to see what the whole wheels look like since we all um, have smaller pieces in our kits. So this is the wheel of Mount Tam. It comes in this beautiful cheese paper. It's absolutely precious and adorable and very well protected in its little cheese paper. So we'll set him over there. Her, it, over there, whatever. Okay, so our next- probably a her. I think it's probably a her, right? It's cowgirl creamery. All right, so the next cheese, I'm gonna keep a stack here is a cheese called Aries made by Shooting Star Creamery. So if anyone here is familiar with a cheesemaker called Central Coast Creamery, mm. um, they make cheeses like Seascape. You, 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 we've had maybe one of them in a class in the past. I think we've done one or two in a Friday board before Seascape. They have Holy Cow. Um, <laughs> yeah, they have really, it's holy like H-O-L-E-Y because it has little holes in it. So um, they do really, really wonderful, very small production California cheeses. So the cheesemaker there has a daughter um, who has grown up making cheeses with her dad, of course, because when you're in the cheese business, you um, pretty much work in cheese and your whole family works in cheese and you're all up every hour of the day making cheese together. 
Um, so Reggie, who is the cheesemaker of Central Coast Creamery, his daughter, um, uh, what is her name? Not Alexa, Avery. I think I'm, yes, Avery, oh my gosh. So his daughter, Avery, um, is 15 years old and she started to be into making her own cheese. And he said, you know what? I like that you wanna shoot for the stars. Get it? Shooting star creamery. Let's shoot for the stars. I'm gonna make you a side creamery where you can have your own cheese recipes. You can play around, you can tinker. You can make your own cheese just for fun, trying to instill that passion, right? She's like, okay, dad, thanks. So her first batch of cheese um, was made in 2019. I think she's now maybe 17. She was 15 at the time. And she was like, just for fun, I'm gonna submit my cheese to the American Cheese Society um, annual awards about, there's about 2000 entries into the American Cheese Society annual cheese judging competition. And um, her cheese, Aries, won first place in her class. So she was like the number one in this style of cheese. And she won third place overall. So literally out of 2000 wow. cheeses, the judges chose this cheese as the third best cheese across the board in her first year, 15 years old. And is this blind or is mm -hmm. her story oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the only one there? No, 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 no. Yeah, it's, it's just blind. I mean, some of the cheeses you're like, that's Mount Tam. Like right. it's not gonna be a big mystery, right? But when you have a cheese like this cut up into pieces, you don't know what it is. Wow. You would never know. So, so this graphic, is this her? Yes. Okay, let me put yeah, it up. So that is Avery. Um, and I believe that's the picture of her actually making the cheeses. I can't remember which one I chose. She has so many great pictures um, of, of her work. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, there she is. And I love it. She's got a t-shirt on here um, that says um, a million dreams keeping me awake. So if anyone has ever seen The Greatest Showman, uh, my children and I watch it all the time and listen to the soundtrack probably every day. So I saw that t-shirt <laughs> and I was like, oh, a million dreams That's keeping funny. me awake. So um, anyway, so there she is uh, draining some of her cheeses in baskets. So anyway, this is the Aries by Shooting Star Creamery. It is aged for about eight months. It's considered sort of an Alpine style, um, but I find it to be much more kind of Gouda-like myself. It's got a very thin layer of food uh, grade wax on the outside. So this would probably be a, 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 a cheese you would not want to eat the rind on. If you've already eaten some of the rind, please don't like purge. Uh, it will not harm you. It's just not going to be super tasty and um, and won't really be additive to your experience. Um, but Aries is not surprisingly a sheep's milk cheese. All of her cheeses are named after um, not aquatic signs. What is that thing called? Oh my gosh, astro um, astrological Astrology. signs. Yes. Yeah. So she's got um, Aries. She's got Scorpio. She's got several different cheeses, and they're all named after astrological signs. So this one obviously um, is made from sheep's milk. And so this is just one of my favorite new cheeses. And I um, was very, very excited when this box arrived. Yeah, that's pretty that's yep. awesome story. There you go. Thank you. And it's funny because when I called once, I think I got um, Reggie on the phone because mm. he said something like, oh, I've been meaning to teach Avery how to, how to um, I don't know if he said to ship cheese, but it was something like how to Package I can't remember or... something like that. I don't yeah. remember what it was. I don't want to say she's never shipped anywhere. I, I don't think that's it. But it was something that he said that was so cute. And I was like, oh. Really good. Isn't that not fabulous? Yeah. Mm, 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 mm. Oh my gosh, I could eat that all day. Questions, comments. Mm. Oh, this is nice. That's I don't texture. know if you uh... it's like if you like Manchego mm. from Spain, it would be the equivalent of like a seemingly very young manchego, although it is aged for eight months. Part of it is when a cheese is aged in wax like this, it maintains a lot of that, that moist feeling, even though the flavors develop as the cheese ages throughout that whole time. But this shell, in a sense, on the outside helps to keep the cheese very moist and tender on the inside, even though it's developing all those wonderful flavors. Wonderful. Oh, and it's really good with the wine, not surprised, but fantastic all right all right let's uh do a history of california wine now. okay so let's do a history of california wine. i'll keep this brief because i know we're all here to eat cheese but i think it's a really fascinating history and something that's cool to learn about tell me when you have the timeline of california wine all right so this Ready. is going to be oh okay timeline of mm -hmm. california wine okay that should be up all right now. wonderful so the um, first grapes were planted in California in the late 1600s. And like so many wonderful um, food inventions throughout the history of humankind, uh, monks were an integral part of the 
process. So um, we had Spanish monks who came from Spain, of course, who were settling um, South America. I'm sorry, they were settling, yes, they were settling um, uh, Mexico, they were settling in Southern California and Baja, and, um, and they brought their food and wine traditions with them. So they were the first ones who planted grapes for the purpose of making wine. And they were the first ones who um, started making cheese in a similar fashion to they had what to what they had experienced um, back in their homeland. So it's a pretty cool, um, a pretty cool history there of, um, of cheese making. So when we talk about, um, and wine, so we're talking about wine right now, not the cheeses, gel. Okay, so first grapes planted in the late 1600s, but it was a grape that is called the mission grape, not surprisingly, and it was just not very good. It was not a grape that could be aged at all. It was really um, a, a wine that was drunk very, very young and had no, no um, ability to really be aged or, or, or appreciated for any real, no depth. frankly, no complexity at all. Complexity, it, was not, it was not considered very delicious until the 1830s when a gentleman um, from France came over from Bordeaux and said, hey guys, we grow these, <laughs> these really great grapes over in Bordeaux, uh, grapes like a Cabernet Sauvignon and grapes like um, uh, Merlot and uh, I think maybe some Malbec, I can't remember if it was Malbec, but Cabernet and Merlot. Um, and uh, he's like, we should try these here. And he did and they took, they did really, really, really beautifully. So that is when sort of winemaking truly started in earnest was about the mid 1800s. And this is when Americans um, or settlers here started making wines that could actually be appreciated and aged for any period of time, which was a relatively new concept for them. And then in the mid 1800s came a very impactful historical event called the gold rush, which was, you know, there's gold in our hills, right? So they discovered gold out West and everyone and their mother wanted to move out to California and the surrounding area there was this absolutely unprecedented influx of population to those areas. So anyone who was making anything food related or wine related, their business just exploded. And so this is why California really became, um, in a sense, a hub of agricultural development is because they had this super fast surge in population and they had to have a way to feed them and, and, you know, and give them beverages and whatnot. So that was the gold rush. People had lots of money so they could spend to invest in, in businesses, invest in factories. They would open their own cheese making places. They would open their own wine making places. It was really, really cool. Um, and then in about 1860, was one of the first times that American wine really had an impact internationally. And that was when something called phylloxera was spreading all throughout Europe. And phylloxera was a little mite that would grow on the roots only of grape vines. And it would just basically gobble up the grape vines and they would just die. And so everywhere from France um, uh, to Spain to Germany, they were all, um, they lost just massive, massive percentages of their grape vines that were just dying. Um, in the vineyards because of phylloxera was just eating everything. And they thought it would be the end of European wine forever. They could not find a cure. They used to try and burn their fields to kill the phylloxera. They would try to drown their fields to kill the phylloxera and nothing ever worked. It was this, it was just a huge, huge issue. Then they discovered that American vines were immune to phylloxera. So they took the roots of American vines, they shipped them over to Europe and they grafted European vines onto American roots. And it is said that the American um, wine roots are the reason that um, sort of uh, European wine was able to recover from that. Let me just try Isn't to get this amazing? straight. It is amazing, but they are the same vines that somebody brought over what it was 35 years right. earlier from Europe. Something happened in America. To that, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I don't know. That's a really interesting question. Like, how did that happen so quickly that they became immune to it? Um, it it's amazing. I don't mm. know. I don't know how it happened so quickly, but they were. And so they sent them back, they grafted, and they were able to save um, all of these countries' wine industries, which was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and then another big thing happened in the 20s here in the United States called prohibition, which just stunk uh, for anyone who was making wine, needless to say. Um, and so it, you know, it obviously took what was then a burgeoning wine industry here in the United States, something to be very proud of and excited about and essentially crushed it. Um, yeah, the government shut all the wineries down. Imagine, imagine that happening. Um, so anyway, uh, they couldn't make wine anymore. And so that lasted, I'm always surprised how long um, prohibition lasted. It was lasted for 13 years. I can't mention it lasted like six months. The people would go like, I oh, forget it. So anyway. Um, so we had um, prohibition then after 1933 that ended. And then 
the really big explosion of American wines. It had been kind of growing steadily after prohibition happened in the year 1976 with something called the Judgment of Paris, which is where there was this blind competition, a tasting competition between um, the famous Bordeaux and Burgundy chateaus in France and these sort of American upstart winemakers coming out of Napa Valley. And the famous story is that basically all the Napa Valley wines won first place and um, none of the French ones won. And so starting in 1976, that was this huge coup in the world of winemaking. And it's when American wine really started to go kind of on the map internationally. And now, of course, the rest is history. It's pretty amazing. The rest um, is history. The rest is history. Yes. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Very cool. Any questions about the timeline of California wines before we jump? We'll have our next cheese and then we can. So there's do... something interesting that's happening. Yeah. I don't know if you know about this, but uh -oh. maybe in the last several years, mm -hmm. some of the California wineries are selling themselves and uh -huh. it's European <laughs> winemakers or mm -hmm. European mm -hmm. champagne houses, whatever. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they're buying the California mm -hmm. wineries. Mm -hmm. Interesting. They are. And not only in California. Yeah, the French um, in particular are seeking out other areas too to make their wine mm -hmm. other than just in Europe. Yeah. So Liz wants to know, um, we just did that uh, Judgment of Paris uh, wine scoop. Do we still have those? We still have the wines. We're not still doing the wine scoop. So you can go in and get the wines, yes. Okay. But so we have all three of the wines that were like the huge coup wines. Um, the Stag's Leap Cabernet, the Chateau Montalena Chardonnay, and um, the Clos de Val Cabernet. And do we, are we... Do we have them on the menu in the restaurant or is it just? One of right? them is on the menu in the restaurant. Yeah. So we have the Stag's Leap uh, Cabernet on the menu in the restaurant and the others are available in the retail shop. But you can always get a bottle from the retail store and it's a $15 corkage. So you could like go get a bottle and sit down and drink a bottle of Chateau Montalena Chardonnay. Um, for, there you go. There's a good yeah. idea. It is a really good idea. So it's a great time to get your hands on those wines. Okay. So Peter Henry has um, mm -hmm. perhaps an explanation of what happened with the the European vines that oh, came I'm over so here Please, yeah. and went back to Europe. So he was saying that the um, the European grape vines were generally grafted to American rootstock when they brought them over. Oh, I did not realize that. Okay, that makes sense then. But it's still a little confusing because again, they were how how did they then when they went back to Europe were they they just it replanted? Was the roots. It was the, okay. yeah, so, they so were the totally roots replanted. Were, were the ones that yeah. were immune. It wasn't, the, okay. the vines were not the problem. It was yeah. the roots of okay. the Okay, so there the you go. Mm -hmm. American root stock. Yep. Oh, that's really, okay, that makes sense then. Um, cool. All right, so let's go on to our next cheese. This is another one that- I thought you were going to go right into- uh, oh, I thought we would do one more cheese and then we'll do the timeline oh, of American okay. cheese. Good. Just so we get to eat a good, little good. more. So um, we're going to go on to our next cheese, which is a super, um, I was going to say it's a super cute cheese. It's actually kind of a homely little cheese, but I love it. It looks so lovingly- handmade. Um, this is a cheese by Bohemian Creamery. I just love that name. And it's called Twist and Shout. All hmm. of the names of their cheeses are super, super cute. And this is a pasteurized goat's milk cheese that is aged for about four months. It's a, a very long cooked cheese. So they take the curd when it's still sort of suspended in the whey and they cook it over high temperature for a long period of time. And it creates cheeses that are very dense in texture. So even though this cheese is only aged for four months, um, you really get an awesome um, kind of cohesive, dense, solid texture. And this cheese has a combination of saffron threads and black peppercorns within it. So it is a wow, super, super cool cheese. And it is um, modeled after um, a Sicilian cheese in a sort of a Sicilian tradition in medieval times. And this particular recipe would have uh, a noble woman would have consumed it to cure her depression. I mean, cheese does make you happier, wow. clearly. Um, but I think it's kind of a neat, neat story. You can totally throw in on this if you want. If you don't want to, if you're like, oh, that's ugly, no, then don't eat it. But it's very right. good, very. It's not great. Yeah, very neat. Mm. Definitely. Mm. You really get the saffron. Yeah. Mm. It's oh different. Gosh. I like it. Mm. So when I say this is made by hand. Did you put up the picture of the woman yeah. for her goat? It's like literally completely made by hand. In fact, you can even tell with this piece here, you can like see the shape of the straining basket. Like they, you know, they, they've not um, gone to any lengths to sort of even out the wheel or flatten it or do it. I mean, it just is, it's like a truly, truly 
handmade and just really, really supremely delicious. That's kind of neat how they just leave it sort yeah. of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, natural. clarification, mm -hmm. twist and shout, you, on the handout it says pasteurized sheep, oh, on your goat. notes here it says pasteurized it's goat. goat. I'm sorry. It is goat? Yeah, it is goat. Sorry. Let's go Sometimes back and look I at that, that picture and see what, yeah. See what it's my bad. All right. Um, I have pasteurized goat on my sheet here, which is actually makes it even funnier. Yep, those look like goats to me. Yep, they're cool. goats. Okay. All right. Um, any questions about twist and shout? Uh, this one was made in Sonoma County. There you um, go. That was a question. Yep. And Sonoma what was County. number two? So twist number and shout Sonoma. Two is this one is made in Marin County. Point. Uh, no, that no, that's that's Mount Tam. I'm sorry. Oh, it's in Central Coast. Paso Robles. Paso Robles or Paso Robles. Um, as you are told to pronounce it, if you are from Paso Robles. Really? Yes, Paso Robles. Like Ancient Peaks uh, wines. You know, we did the wine dinner with them. So that's Paso Robles. Robles, cool. It's how you know the locals versus the not locals. It's like being from Louisville. Same right. exact thing. Huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yes, and so Kate wants to know that's Rind and Twist and Shout, right? Is that a question? That's, it was that, a this question. Is, yes, this is the rind. Yeah. Um, it's just a natural rind, which is just the exterior of the cheese that has dried out and hardened. Mm -hmm. Yep, and you can totally, totally eat this. It was good. Um, oh yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's very soft and um, you know sometimes it, you know an, an aged cheese like the rind can be kind of cardboardy and hard to chew. This is not no, the not case with this, and I think it adds some interesting earthiness to it. But again, if you're like me, don't eat it. You don't have to. But I think it's it's pretty nice actually. Any other questions, Bib? Before we uh, talk about the timeline of California cheese, I'm ready. Should I put up Are the you ready? Uh, sure. Timeline? All right. So California cheese um, got its start a little about 100 years after the wine industry, uh, but also by monks, um, Spanish monks who loved their cheese and uh, and wanted to just sort of grow that same that same product here in the United States. And by 1800, we were actually exporting cheeses which is a pretty fast growth period. Um, the first exported cheese actually went to Russian Alaska was where it was exported to, which I think hmm. is kind of interesting. And, um, and then again, the, the gold rush that we mentioned earlier in terms of wine had the exact same impact on cheese, which was to make that industry just explode. There were so many people to feed. So not only was there a huge influx of humans, there was a follow-on influx of dairy populations. So cows, 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 just coming not only for meat, but for dairy. And, um, and so this whole United States as like an agricultural nation really, really exploded during, um, during the gold rush because there were so many people with money who needed to eat and drink. And um, it was very, very good to the cheese industry. Um, what was not good for the cheese industry was World War I, um, followed close on by World War II. So in World War I in the 19 teens, um, you basically couldn't get anything imported from anywhere else. And so all of these immigrants to the United States, these Spanish immigrants, these Italian immigrants, these German immigrants, they were like, I miss my cheeses and I can't get my cheeses. And so that's the generation that started to create cheeses here in the United States to mimic European cheeses. Um, and uh, so that's why you see a really, really big explosion of this sort of American style, um, but really born from this necessity of not being able to get product from Europe. So, but it ended up being a really, really great thing. Um, the, our final cheese today is actually 100% a result of that, the dry jack. And we'll, I'll tell you that mm. story a little bit. Um, but yeah, so that was that was definitely a tough time, you know, World War One and World War Two. But it was, again, it was a time where Americans learned how to be more self-sufficient agriculturally instead of just importing their luxury goods or importing their interesting things that they remembered from their homeland. They learned how to make them themselves here in the United States. So it ended up being, in the long run, a blessing, but it was not a blessing back when it was going on for sure. Um, and then all throughout the early 1900s. Um, you know, we were developing the cheese industry, kind of industrial cheese was, was becoming a thing. Um, certainly after World War II, industrial food making in general, this was the decades of formula being invented for babies, of canned foods being invented, frozen foods. Um, this is when all of those things started to explode was uh, sort of after World War II. And, um, and the cheese industry was no, was no different at all. Um, it became very industrial. So you see lots of factories for cheese making, lots of American style cheese, uh, for, for lack of a better term, being born and, and sort of commercial 
industrial cheese making, which was not necessarily the greatest type of cheese in the world. And it was only then in the 1970s in California specifically where the, what is called the American artisan cheese movement was born. And so these were um, almost to a person, women who were home and had children, had families and wanted to find a better way to feed their children and their families than with industrially produced foods. And one of those was cheese. And so they started to get little goats and they would start to make goat's milk and goat's milk cheeses. Um, and then before you know it, restaurants were taking these, um, these goat's milk cheeses it was almost all goat's milk in the beginning and putting them on their restaurant menus. Um, Alice Waters was a huge proponent of goat's milk cheeses back in the 1970s. And, um, and that is the beginning of the American artisan cheese movement was, was at that time. Um, and then ever since then, it has just been a trajectory like this. It's just been an amazing amount of growth in the American artisan cheese movement. And it's kind of ironic. It's very full circle that, um, that now American artisan cheese making is one of the most traditional style of cheese making. So there are so many cheesemakers here in the United States that are making cheeses by hand with um, natural animal rennets and no, no pasteurization. There's all raw milk um, with no um, sort of foreign bacteria at all. Like it's really, really cool. It's a true return to the most ancient ways of making cheese. And a lot of it's happening here in the States, as you can see right in front of you. Really, really cool. All right. Awesome. Questions before we try our next California cheese. It's a really, really yummy one. We're excited for you guys to try this one. This is a cheese called Leonza. It's made um, by Fiscalini Cheese or Fiscalini Farms is their official name in Modesto, California. Aged for about six months um, and it's made from unpasteurized cow's milk. So this is, um, they are very much identifying with their Swiss roots. The Fiscalini mm. family was um, historically from Switzerland and came and migrated to the United States in the early 1900s and started um, as a dairy. So they just produced milk. Well, they didn't produce the milk, but they had cows to produce milk. And then um, sometime later said, hey, we should, we should make cheese too. And it was, a, it was a good deal later that they decided to start making cheese. I think it was like something like 2005. And I think it was like the fourth generation. Fiscalini went over to Switzerland to learn more about his homeland. And he learned while there that his ancestors had been professional cheesemakers. And he was like, oh my gosh, we've got all of this milk why are we not making cheese? And he started making cheeses and oh my gosh, they have just done beautiful, beautiful, beautiful cheeses, completely family operation, fourth generation. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. mm, mm, mm. I'm gonna get a little bit of smokiness with that. It's Is not it, smoke. It's not mm -mm. smoke? Mm -mm. Nope. That, that seems impossible. Nope. Wow. Huh. Isn't that awesome? Surprising. Yeah, I assumed for sure that it was mm. smoked. The depth of flavor and the fact that it's obviously a hard cheese against age for about six months, but when you start chewing it, it just kind of melts in your mouth. It's so creamy on the palate. So this is just, I don't know, I could just, I could eat this all the time. It's also yeah. great cooking cheese. Wonderful. If you want to cook with it, melts beautifully. Grates beautifully. It grates great. Get it? Grates great. No. Um, so this is Leonza, raw cow's milk, <laughs> Modesto, California. Thomas and Colleen thinks it, say they think it tastes like smoked cheddar. I'll <laughs> take that as a compliment, I hope. No, nah, they're goofing on me. Oh, yeah. What that like? Jeff hates cheddar. Oh, it's so good with the wine, y'all. If you've not tried it with the wine yet, please do that. Please do that. I do not have a wheel of Leonza with me because it weighs about 30 pounds. So it's about this big around or about that, let's say that tall. It's a beast. Oh wow. Um, so we only got one of them. And so we have cut it, you know, obviously for the class, but I have a great video of, um, of one of our cheesemongers cutting the Leonza and it's so big and very, very tough to cut. So at one point she actually has to put her knee up on the on the end of the board, like to, to brace herself and pull it. It's unbelievable. So I was like, oh, that's the coolest thing ever, but it's huge. So I don't have that with me. Was that in the reel, the Instagram reel? Yeah, but I, I kind of did that faster. So oh, well, but yeah, but you can see it. You can see her knee there when she's, when she's cutting it. In it Instagram, separate. I have a reel of all of the cheeses um, as we were preparing them. And so you can see Lisa in there um, cutting that one. It's pretty funny. Funny. Mm -hmm. Questions about Leonza. Anyone? Oh, so um, 
So Leah and then Dave concurs, um, mm -hmm. taste olive brine in the rind. Oh, absolutely. There's absolutely um, like a brininess, savoriness to this, for sure. Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, hmm. I think it's really, it's fantastic. That's cool. Um, they also make a really, really great cheese that was too young for me to get for this class. It wasn't ready yet, called San Joaquin Gold. Hmm. One of the best cheeses I've and ever this had. is the third one where they're mm -hmm. basically small shops in California that almost don't yeah. ship or yeah. I mean they're, they're they they will ship more. They're probably the, the biggest of these three. Okay. But yeah, no, they don't you can't can't get it on the East Coast. Hmm. They do they do fine out on the West Coast. It's very hard to get it on the East Coast. Huh, so they just really shipped cool. it right to me in this huge box. Huh. It was awesome. All right. Any other questions on Leonza? And again, that was made in Modesto, California. Pretty cool. And then we're going to be going back to Sonoma with our fifth and final cheese. I just love, I love, 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 love everything about this cheese. So this is a cheese called Dry Jack. And if anyone's like, Jack, you mean like Monterey Jack? Yes. So Vela cheese um, was um, started in the late 1800s. They had kind of a dairy thing. And then they started making cheese soon after that in the early 1900s. Um, I think officially they were founded as Vela cheese in like 1931 or something like that. And they started making a cheese called Monterey Jack. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, some people say they invented it. Other people say they didn't invent it. What I do know is that they were some of the very, very first people to make Monterey Jack cheese, which is a very tender, supple, um, pasteurized, or usually pasteurized cow's milk cheese and um, very, very mild and creamy and lovely. So that is Monterey Jack. Well, during this aforementioned period of time where imports of cheese were basically non-existent um, during World War II, they decided to let their young Monterey Jack age more. Why? Because nobody could get Parmesan. You could not get Parmigiano Reggiano. You couldn't get these hard aged cheeses from Italy. And so they said, well, let's see if we can age this puppy and see what happens. Um, and so they started practicing at that and they invented what they call their dry jack, which is like absolutely one of the great, 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 great American cheeses in existence. So dry jack, the reason it's rind is so dark brown is that it is actually coated in um, unsweetened cocoa. Jeff, I have some amazing pictures of them making this cheese. Um, and it starts like number 6A um, kind of shows you there's four of them. And I just have to, I normally would not show you this many on one cheese, but it's the coolest cheese making process because it's like completely by hand and completely cool. Um, wow. So do you see 6A? Have you gotten yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, you kind of throw um, some cheese over the side of the wall there. Right. So they okay. take the cheese curd and they drain it in cheese cloth. It's like a very thick canvassy cheese cloth. Mine are in black and white. They're not nearly yeah. as cool. But they form it into a ball and they wind um, the neck of the ball while simultaneously pressing down on the ball of curd. And you can see the liquid just being yeah. mushed out of there. Um, and then have you got onto the next one with I'm the gentleman the in the hair deck? Yeah. Okay, so then he ties the neck of this bag, this cheese uh, cloth bag with twine, like literally by hand, wrapping it with twine. And then he mushes it really, really flat and mushes it, mushes it, mushes it until as much of the liquid comes out of it um, as they can get out of it. And then, where's the rest of my pictures here? Oh, do I have them over there? I must not have all of mine here. Anyway, so I think the next one is where they're all floating in the yeah, brine bath. Okay, yeah. so then they put them into the brine bath still within their bag. Okay, so this is an important part. So when you look at this cheese, you get the idea. So they still in this bag, they flatten it into this kind of UFO shaped shape. Um, and kind of tie that little knot off. And then they soak them in brine to help harden the outside of the rind and get it ready to be aged. And then as soon as the cheese is hard enough and sort of set, they will rub it by hand with a blend of, again, unsweetened cocoa powder and black pepper. Now, don't think you're gonna be getting like a chocolate cheese here. You would not really hardly know there had been anything rubbed on here other than it looks really, really cool. So this is not like infused into the cheese like chocolatey or anything. Um, but what it will show you, I have a whole wheel of it here, and you can still see the little dimple here. Jeff, can you see this? Yeah, let me just turn this picture up. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, for sure. I want yeah. people to believe it. So you can still see <clears throat> the dimple. Are you able to see that if I hold oh, yeah. it like that? You can still see the dimple here of where they tied that bag off and like the little seams 
um, of where the bag was all wrinkled on top of the cheese. If that is not, and it's like all wonky looking, look, it's like all uneven and like, it was like a fun little steering wheel. So it's just one of the coolest cheeses in the sense that you can completely see the person that made this cheese. It's beautiful to, I don't know, like it makes me emotional. I don't know. It's like, you can like feel the person that, that made this completely handmade. by hand. It's truly incredible. So why chocolate and pepper? What, I don't know. Oh. Isn't that funny? I have no idea. I've tried to find out. I can't find out. Hmm. I don't know why. Maybe they liked that it made it a dark rind. Maybe it helped to preserve it somehow. Give them a call. I don't know, but it's so cool. And the interior of this cheese, this cheese is aged anywhere from seven to 10 months. And that's a pretty big range. If you're like, wow, seven to 10, that's decent. Um, and that is because they just wait until the cheese is right. They just taste them periodically. And they're like, yeah, that's good. That's good. We'll move that one. And that's hmm. it. Like, so there's no like set age. It could be seven months. It could be 10 months. It's just when it reaches this perfect, perfect grana style on the inside. Grana being, being the Italian word for grainy. So if you've ever heard of a cheese called grana padana, um, that means it's like grainy cheese. It's just those very hard uh, aged cheese like Parmigiano Reggiano, that family. So you can absolutely eat the rind on this cheese. Um, or you can skip it if you're like, I can see the guy's handprints on there. I don't want to eat it. Then by all means, don't eat it. But you can see right away, it is an absolutely beautifully textured cheese. Um, it's got the little grains inside. It's going to be a fantastic eating cheese. So please, when you see hard cheeses like this, don't assume that you can only grate them on something. These are wonderful eating cheeses, but it also does grate really, really well. And it melts really well. What do you think? It's pretty good. Mmm. Mmm, it's so savory. I think you can taste the chocolate a little can bit. You? A little bit. Pepper, sure. Mm. At least, I mean, maybe it's because I ate the rind, but mm. yeah. Oh, it's just so good. I'm going to taste it with the wine, and I know it's going to be unbelievable. Yep. I was right. What did I say? It happens all the time. The wine goes really well with it. Every single one of these. It does. Jesus. It's really, really great. And what you're getting in this wine is great acidity. You're getting nice, like a fruit, but not so much fruit that it's like tropicaling you to death. You're getting um, some really, really wonderful structure as well that's helping to complement and bring out these flavors, but it's not going to overshadow. It's like this perfect little marriage. It's just so, so wonderful. So um, Terry wants to know if, hi, if you think this um, particular cheese would go well with a red wine. Absolutely. Yes. And hello, Chick, if Chick is out there as well. But, um, but no, yes. I think this might be a different. Oh, Terry. this is not Chick Terry, and Terry? Terry Feldmeyer. Oh, yeah. Oh, same one. Oh, okay. okay. So, Sorry. um, <laughs> anyway, so absolutely, Terry, this would go great with a red wine. You could do anything on the lighter Italian realm. So, you could do like some Sangiovese, you could do a Barbera. Um, anything from Northern Italy is going to be really, really fantastic. And then you could do kind of a lighter, when I say Sangiovese, I mean, you could do like a lighter Chianti. I wouldn't do a super heavy. Um, like a super Tuscan kind of thing that can have other grapes that will kind of overshadow this. Because even though it is very hard and flavorful, it's, it's still a little subtle yet. So you don't want to even put a red wine on there that's, that's so big and heavy that you drown this out. But I would go for anything like a lighter red, for sure. Dave Obecki says Great. he's drinking red wine with it. And it oh, what says kind? it's pretty good. That's I was going to ask yeah. him. What, yeah, if Dave, Dave if you us, let us know what, what kind of um, cab. red wine. Oh, it's a cab. But you know what? Cab is one of those wines too. Everyone always assumes Cabernet is going to be this like sort of heavy brick like wine and it, they're not Sometimes always it's not yeah some of them are very very sort of playful and and energetic and not they don't always have to be these big heavy i feel like you brought one home the other day that was really oh subtle what was that the rockland ranch yeah it's gonna be on our wine list that's how much i love this wine yeah that was yeah really rockland ranch impressive. cabernet baby unbelievable all right it's time for a poll time for a poll so we always do a poll at the end of class where you the folks at home get to choose which cheese was your favorite. Was it the Mount Tam? Was it the Aries? Was it the Twist and Shout, the Leonza, or the Vela Dry Jack? Are the votes pouring in? The votes are pouring in. Awesome, wonderful. Which one would I choose? Oh, I don't know. Sometimes it's totally obvious. Um, yeah. So while the votes are coming in, can I talk real briefly about a couple other events that we have coming up? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So the next um, July at Cheese Seek, the entire month of July is Mozzarella Fest. We have a special mozzarella themed menu. We have special um, 
cocktails, sandwich, all sorts of really, really cool stuff. We're going to do lots of events around that. But one of the events around Mozzarella Fest, <laughs> Mozzarella Fest is an at-home mozzarella making workshop. So Chef Natasha and I are going to lead that together from my kitchen. And you all are going to get your own kit with um, sort of a, the, the curd, the raw curd and the salt, all the goodies that you're going to need, as well as some beautiful accompaniments so that when you're finished with your homemade mozzarella, you can eat it in style uh, with, with various goodies to go along with it. So we're going to make our own mozzarella at home. And that is going to be on July 21st. Uh, I don't have it up online yet. So hang tight. I will get it up online, but just mark your calendars now. It's going to be amazing. Super, super excited. We also have two wine dinners. If you're not doing anything this coming Tuesday, sign up right now for our Greek wine dinner. It's going to be great. Oh my gosh. The menu is unbelievable. The wines, they blew my mind. They blew my mind. If anyone is like, oh, Greek wine is just like Santorini, right? No, it's such a beautiful spectrum of Greek wines. And we're doing six of them. And that red wine has at the end, mm -hmm. how many points does that one have? 97, yeah. I think. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. So super, yeah. super excited. Mm -hmm. um, and then in... July, on July 12th, very, very special uh, wine dinner with Dow Vineyards out of California. Mm, so excited, um, including their Soul of a Lion Cabernet, one of the most highly regarded wines in the entire world is going to be in that wine dinner. And we're going to hear the um, truly the heart wrenching story of these two uh, young boys from Lebanon uh, caught in the um, war there and how they escaped the country and eventually made it to the United States, started making wine, and then became some of the most esteemed winemakers in the entire world. It's such an amazing, amazing story of family. Uh, it's beautiful. And their wines are, oh my gosh. Hmm. It, we tasted eight the other day and I can only have five in the dinner. So the other three, we're going to make a flight in the restaurant because I couldn't choose. So <laughs> we're just doing that. All right. How are our votes? All right. Votes are all in. All I'm right. going to end the poll. And the poll. And I'm going to share the results. And I'm going to say, I would have picked the one that did worst. Really? Yeah. Oh, well, let's start that way. Which one did worst? Twist and Shout. Really? That would have been mine. It was the most oh. interesting and unique, and, and in a good way, I thought. Not yeah. just that was weird. Oh, that's but interesting. I, thought, I don't wow, know that, that I would have expected it to do the, the worst. That is really pretty cool. Oh, okay. So what did best? Okay. Number one was Aries. It's a good I'm story, surprised. too. It was it's very a good. It's story. a good story. It's a really good yeah. cheese, too. Yeah. Really, really good And then cheese. it was very, uh, then tied for two right behind Mount Tam and Leonza. I mean, yeah. And then the dry jack was. Yeah. Mount Tam is always, there is always so well regarded. I mean, people just love Mount yeah, Tam. Uh, Leah's right. She says the closest she's seen. I, I agree. It, there were three that were just next Just right on top of each other. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Uh, oh, good. Well, I love you, Twist and Shout. <laughs> Jonathan says, ask the question differently. What was the least favorite? Uh, next time. Not the worst, <laughs> the least favorite. Yeah. We want to recount. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Are there any more questions before we wrap up for the evening? Everything's available online. Everything is online. So I'll send out the email with the link. But if you just go to our online store and click on events and videos, you'll see a whole section there that's items from previous classes. The wine is there. And when I say get this, I mean, you, you literally will not see it anymore after our supply is gone. So if you want to zip on back and get yourself a few bottles of this, it's a great price point too. I would definitely go for and it. You're not getting it to take home from Capitol Grill, right? No, yeah, you gotta no, go not. And drink it. Um, and then all of the cheeses are there as well. And I even put all of the Effie's cakes there. So there's the corn and the oat and the ginger <laughs> and oh my gosh, they're so good. So I will send you all an email with the link to that. And um, I hope to see every one of you and more at our mozzarella making workshop yeah. in July. And seriously, and at the Greek dinner. sign up for the wine dinners. It's just cheeseteak.com slash wine dinner. And you'll see them listed there. Do not miss out on these. They are going to be amazing. And that's all I got. Awesome. Thank see you, all you soon. so, so, so very much for joining us. I will see you next time. Always a pleasure uh, eating cheese with you. <laughs>